Um, today is May 26, 2005. We're at the home of Edward Vasek in Ada, Michigan. And we're interviewing Edward Vasek, who fought in the Vietnam War. The interviewer is Brett Vasek. Say your name for the record, please. My name is Edward Vasek. Where, what year were you born? I was born in 1949, October 5th. Uh, what branch of the military were you in? I was in the United States Army. What group did you fight in? Well, in Vietnam, I was in the 502 Military Intelligence Group. It was a very small division. It was, uh, it was all by itself. Okay. Um, what city did you grow up in? I, grew, I was born and grew up in Midland, Michigan. Did you go to high school? Yes, I graduated from Midland High School in 1967. What was that like compared to modern high school? It was a lot bigger. There was over 3,000 kids in my high school. There was only three grades, 10, 11, and 12. I had over 850 kids in my graduating class. It was very, very big. Wow. And the rules were a lot stricter than they are today. <laughs> in fact, I remember when I was a sophomore, we were allowed to wear jeans finally to school. Wow. Uh, how far in your education did you get before you were joining the military? Did you go to college? Yes, I had one year of college before I had a two-year vacation in the Army. <laughs> what were you doing before the, in the military? Any jobs? Were you involved in any sports? Well, I've, I've, I was out of high school, so I wasn't doing any sports then. But uh, Well, I guess I was playing softball in some softball leagues. But I was working and going to college. Um, I had several jobs. The, the last one I had... I was working in a uh, carpentry shop, making um, cabinets. It was a cabinet shop. Okay. Do you remember where you, when you first found out the war was taking place in Vietnam? I was very interested in the news way back when I was very young. I was watching stuff on Vietnam when I was 10, 11, and 12 years old. The war in Vietnam lasted 10, 12, 15 years, if you remember. Of course, you probably don't. Yeah. But... It was interesting that I was watching it on TV 10 years before I was there. Wow. So let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> okay. Pay attention to what's going on in the Middle East. You may be there in a few years. Yes. Did you enlist in the military or were you drafted? I was drafted under the old draft system. That was before the lottery system that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, the old draft system, when the draft board wanted you, they took you. Okay. Okay. What's the new one compared? The new one, they, a lot of people didn't think that old draft system was fair because a lot of, they felt as though that a lot of minorities were picked. Um, uh, it was given as punishment to some people that uh, they got in trouble by judges. You go to jail or you go to the military, you, you go to the draft. Or um, it was felt that a lot of people that didn't have money, poor people who, who, uh, who didn't have any influence, it, people thought that they were drafted ahead of, of, of people that had some affluence. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you volunteer to go into the Army or to go to Vietnam? I, once I was drafted, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I was uh, 19 years old, and I, uh, I just felt as though if I was going to be in the Army, I might as well see the war. Okay. I wanted a little bit of excitement. <laughs> what was the highest rank you achieved while you were in the Army? I achieved the rank of sergeant, and that's as high as you could go in that short period of time. Where was your boot camp at? Uh, boot camp was at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Uh, boot camp was eight weeks of, of very hard, intense training. And then I volunteered. I was a volunteer for, um, I was a medical research guinea pig there for another, I think it was another five weeks or six weeks. What other bases did you go to while you were in the United States? So? After, um, after boot camp, I uh, went to Fort Gordon, Georgia in, Augusta, in the Augusta, Georgia area, and I was there for what they call AIT, Advanced Individual Training, where I was, uh, my training, I had to get a secret security clearance and I was trained with telecommunications equipment, the stuff that they had at the time. Today, this, I mean, the, the stuff that I was trained on is, 
is dark ages. It's archaic. And um, after that training, once I got orders, uh, orders that I was going to go to Vietnam, um, and I had, I ended up with a top secret security clearance which may or may not have been a mistake, I don't know, but I ended up, I needed a secret security clearance, I ended up with a top secret security clearance, and I went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, where uh, the CIA uh, did um, briefings and training for me, and that was just a two-week uh, uh, briefing, training seminar-like thing. Going back to your boot camp, did you find it difficult? Boot camp is difficult. However, um, you're told the first day that you go in that when it gets tough and you don't think you can take it anymore, just remember that your dad did it, your uncle did it, your cousin did it, your friends did it, and that's what keeps you going. You find a way to get through. Do you remember your instructors? I remember a couple of my instructors. I remember my drill sergeant, Drill Sergeant White, who was the biggest man that I'd ever met. He was uh, almost seven foot tall, uh, was from Mississippi uh, originally, um, played football for the Army. He must have weighed 320 pounds. And uh, when he wore his dress uniform, he was a veteran paratrooper, so his uniform was very, very impressive. And he had stuff on both sleeves starting from here to here, and medals from here to here, and he was a, he was a, very impressive man, and, and when he said jump, you simply ask how high. After your training was complete, what other bases were you sent in the United States? I wasn't. After my training was complete, I went to Vietnam. How did you first feel when you found out you were departing to Vietnam? Well, I expected it. I wasn't, I, I, I didn't have any feeling one way or the other. I, 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 uh, most friends of mine that were drafted during those years a lot of people went Brad I mean everybody went either went to college or Vietnam or you did both like I did um, but I had lots and lots of friends that were in Vietnam I think I had uh, I think 14 or 15 of my classmates were killed in Vietnam I mean I knew these these were all people that I knew and so I, I, I wasn't surprised that I was going I didn't feel one way or the other I was scared be just before I went is that what you're asking me I was, I was scared because I didn't want to get hurt. I, you know, you're scared about things like uh, losing a leg or going blind or those are the things that scare you. I mean, you don't think about getting shot and killed. I mean, that, if that's going to happen, that's going to happen. But, but you worry about getting hurt and if you can handle, what, if you can handle the, the pain and if you can handle, um, you know, what's going to happen. What area were you first sent? What town? Well, you're sent, you're sent, everybody goes into Vietnam, at, I think there are two or three different ports. Uh, the biggest one was, was uh, Benoit and um, um, Long Bin were the, two biggest, were the two biggest bases there. And that's where you had, uh, you were brought into country before you were shipped out to your units, your, your base camps. So I, I, went, to, I went to Benoit. And the first night I was there, we were rocketed. My, my very first night in country, we were rocketed. What was that like? It was awful. It was awful simply because, because uh, you, don't, you don't know what to do. I mean, you're brand new in country. Imagine, imagine the, your first day at school. Or to, imagine your first day at a brand new school, and all of a sudden there's a fire. And you don't know where to go, where to run, what to do. I remember... Uh, Somebody yelling incoming. Somebody yelled incoming after we heard the mortars uh, flop in. And uh, everybody trying to run to a bunker. Um, you know what a bunker is? It's a, okay. Ran into a bunker, and somebody standing by the bunker saying, No, don't go in there, don't go in there. I said, Well, why, why? There's full of rats and snakes. Well, what do we do? What do we do? He says, Well, you laid down next to us. So we laid down next to these bunkers. With these mortars going off now, I, you know, unbeknownst to us, the mortars were, you know, like three blocks away. I mean, we weren't even close to get, but we, you don't know that. I mean, you don't know where to go, what to do. Um, scared to death, and uh, so I slept all night on a pile of rocks. 
I slept all night on a pile of rocks next to this bunker. There was, I slept the rest of the night there. And when I woke up, the sun woke me up, and when I looked down my arm, I was sleeping on my arm, when I looked down on my arm, I, there was lizards crawling all over my arm. And I jumped up, it you know, bothered me, and everybody laughed. They told me that they, they won't hurt you, they won't bite you, they won't hurt you. But I'll never forget, that was my first night in Vietnam, and I, all I thought of was um, only 364 more days of this crap. What other, uh, you mentioned the lizards, what other animals were there out in Vietnam? Well, they have, the, the, they're snakes. I mean, I had a big boa constrictor one time in my bedroom, a huge boa constrictor. I had, uh, they had what they used to call the, it was a black, um, I believe it was called a black racer, Brett. It was the, but the GIs called it the three-stepper. Because if it bit you, you took three steps and you, you, you had about three steps and you were dead. And the joke was that if this three-stepper bit you, please do everybody a favor and just lay down and crush your hands over top of your your uh, chest like this. It would be, make it easier for them to move the body. Now, I never heard of anybody getting bit by one, but that was uh, that was bad. The other bad thing, of course, there were rats, and rats were everywhere. And um, you had to be extremely careful because if you got bit by a rat, you had to go through the rabies shots. And you, you know what those are where you sh they give you shots in the stomach? Um, they get a needle about this long, they shoot shoot uh, they give you shots right in your stomach for rabies and it's awful it's it's horrible and you have to make a decision if you get bit by a rat you have to make a decision whether you want to report it or not either gonna die or rat die of rabies or have the shots you know what were the weather conditions like weather conditions imagine sweating from every pore in your body uh, it is extremely hot, 100 and, 110, 15, 20 degree hot. Um, and then you have the rainy season. You have the, you, it, it's, 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 uh, it's a tropical climate. So, uh, you know, tropical jungle. So when it rains, the humidity is just awful. You just, you're constantly drenched with sweat all the time. What was life like on the base? Life on the base. Well, you know, it, I mean, it was okay. you had to make the best of the situation. I mean, we had, you make friends and, and you get together and you talk and, and um, you try to make, you try to make your, 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 what we used to call a hooch. That's what you lived in. That was your, your house was a, like a hooch and a hooch was a, was a building that was that was half wood and half screen. You don't have screen halfway up so that you know you get a breeze through there because because of the heat. Um, what was the question? What would, would how is the life like on the base? Like, well, I mean, it, it, we everybody everybody tried to bring had music that they were interested in, so they played music. You know, you'd have some kids from Oklahoma and Texas that would play country. You'd have kids from New York that would play rock and roll. And you learned, actually, I learned, I had a gentleman in my outfit that was a classical guitarist. I mean, so I listened to a lot of classical guitar. I mean, we had a lot of fun. We drank some wine and we'd tell, tell stories about uh, back home, which we used to call back in the world, back in the world. That's what you called home, was uh, when I go back to the world, that, that meant going home. Um, it was okay. I mean, they tried to have movies for you every once in a while, and and uh, they had a TV station, um, uh, AF AFVN, Armed Forces Vietnam Network, I think it was called, where they had one TV station, and they would show you like uh, sporting events from home, like the Super Bowls or the Stanley Cup playoff, or sporting events or or specials, TV shows, and that sort of thing. So you watch that when it was on, but but there were limited hours. It was only on two three hours a day. Uh, was the food on the base good? Well, uh, I don't know if this is going to get in your questioning, but I had, I was, because I was in military intelligence, and I was considered, I was given civilian status, um, I was given what they call a MACV meal card, all right? With a MACV meal card, I could eat anywhere in the country. I could eat in what they called officer's mess, where the best food in the Army was served like to the officers and the generals and those sort of people. I could walk in and flash this 
military uh, uh, mess ID, and I could eat anywhere. So I ate very well. I, I ate better than most people in Vietnam ate. On your base, did you have any specific duties, jobs that you had to do? Well, I had the same duties as everybody else in my in my group had. We had a five, depending on who was transferring in and out of country, we had anywhere from five to six. I think maybe one time we had seven men was the biggest we ever had. And our duties were to gather information from Vietnamese agents, disseminate, put the information together to where it made sense, where there were troop movements, uh, enemy troop movements, and uh, I told you there's three things you need to find out when you're, when you're in Army, Army Intelligence. You need to find out um, what direction the troops are moving in, how big is the force that you're dealing with, and what kind of weapons you want. So, so when your agents are out there gathering information on, on, on the enemy, those are the three things you want. Troop movements, the size of the force, and the type of, the, and the type of the weapons. And our job was to uh, uh, put that information together to where it made sense, and then if we thought it would warrant a B-52 strike or an artillery strike or what we used to call Puff the Magic Dragon, which was a helicopter with what they called miniguns on it, um, we would order those to go eliminate that enemy threat. Uh, what did you do for fun in your spare time? Lots. We had a lot of fun. Um, um, we were the Frisbee champs, I think, on the base. <laughs> that was one thing we did. Um, they had, they would have shows from time to time. They would bring bands in and, and that sort of thing. It, that, that would happen once in a while. But, but even more important than that, we had a helicopter at our disposal. And um, we actually rented a villa on the South China Seas that's on the, on the ocean. And uh, we would, when we had some time off, we'd all go over to this place in, in a town called Vung Tau. And Vung Tau at one point was a, was a French resort area. So it had a lot of nice restaurants and buildings and hotels and beautiful beaches. I learned how to surf. I surfed there. I uh, spent some time on the beach and just had a good old time before I went back to the war. What did you do? Did you have any time for fun while you were actually in the war still? Like That's what I mean. I mean, we would run our own duty. We, what we would do is we would work like... Um, I'm trying to think, Brett, how we did that. I think we ended up working straight shifts. Like we'd work 72 hours straight and then take 72 hours off. So, yeah, you'd be tired, but you'd be looking forward to the time off you had and you'd jump on a helicopter or take your Jeep. I had my own Jeep. I bought a Jeep for 13 sheets of plywood and uh, I could take that Jeep wherever I wanted. It was mine. And so we would take it to different places. Maybe we'd go into, sometimes we even went into Saigon for some fun, for some entertainment. Were you able to keep touch with your family members back in America? Only through letters. I mean, we didn't have the communication. Uh, you know, that's the old days where you wrote letters. Uh, we didn't have the communications. There wasn't such thing as cell phones back then. I remember one time waiting at the USO in line to make a phone call back. There was a time difference, like 12 hours, something like that. It was a ridiculous time difference. I, uh, I one time went to the USO in Saigon and called my mother and father from a from a, like a payphone type of thing to try to get to them and it was a long delay and then the, you know it, 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 the message messages weren't very clear but at least you got to say hi and you know you missed each other and you told them you loved them and and that was it so you got you know you waited in line for a half hour to talk for three minutes I think th you had three minutes to you could talk so Did you get to write letters wherever you were no matter yeah where? Uh -huh, you got to write letters that's the only way to communicate in those days Brett. Uh, did you see money combat or a lot of combat? More than I wanted to. Were you directly involved, like in? A couple times, sure, like sure. What happened there? Well, um, th there were there were several times when we were ambushed in convoys, and those are those are very. I mean, those those deals. Um, those deals is your when when you're going from city to city base camp to base camp. You wanna you try to hook up with a convoy, an armored convoy. And, you know, convoy, you know what a convoy is. I mean, you're, you're, you've got jeeps with machine guns, and it's usually what they call a POL convoy, 
petroleum oil lubricants. They're uh, uh, they're taking they're taking gasoline maybe to another base camp because they need or diesel fuel. Okay, and so you would hook up with this convoy because it was protected. They might have helicopters overhead watching them, um, but lots of times you get ambushed. I mean, you'd ambush. They put they put uh, mines, um, anti-personnel mines, um, machine guns. That sort of thing. I was caught in several of those. But the worst thing we ever went through was our base camp was overrun for three days during the Tet Offensive of 19, it was either 69 or 70, Brett, I don't remember for sure. And what that means is that we had Viet Cong inside of our wire. Uh, we had, you know, a, a wire is your perimeter, or what you call your perimeter, your base camp, but we had them inside our wire. That means instead of shooting out, you've got to look behind you because they might be shooting into you. And um, that's when I was shot at. Um, I, I, I might have been killed if the guy was, wouldn't have been a better shot. I, um, we spent um, the better part of two days in a bunker, and I didn't want to be there anymore. I decided to go back. The bunker was like, like 50... 50 to 75 yards from the hooch, and I decided I was too tired. I was going to go back to my bed and go to sleep, go sleep in a real bed. And no sooner did I go to bed when the mortars started coming in, mortars and rockets started coming in. So I, uh, I grabbed my mattress and put my mattress over top of me, and I was going to run, run from the hooch back to the bunker where everybody else was. And I was going to use the, I was wearing a flak jacket and shorts and, you know, shower sandals and, and I had the mattress over top of me, thinking if the, if a mortar went off, that the mattress would get some of the shrapnel, because the shrapnel was hitting the side of the building and the roof and, and everything else. And when I ran out, when I ran out, I looked across the road, which was maybe another another sixty or seventy yards, and there was a Viet Cong with a rifle, and he was getting ready to aim at my buddies who were at the who were sixty or. 50 or 60 yards over here at the bunker, he was getting ready to aim at them to shoot. And when he looked at me and I looked at him, we both freaked out. But then he locked and loaded on me. And all my buddies saw him. They said, get down, get down, get down. So I, 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 uh, I dove for the parking lot. There's a parking lot here, a gravel area. And I went down and I, I went down and this guy started opening up, firing at me, but he fired too low. And all the gravel was hitting me in the face and in the head and because he would hit the gravel, and the gravel was, was firing. And my buddies, there was five of them, all armed with uh, M16s, uh, sidearms, 45s and 38s, um, an M3 carbine, which was a smaller rifle. And those guys must have fired over a thousand rounds, and maybe that's an exaggeration, but at least 800 rounds at that Viet Cong while he was trying to shoot at me and never touched him. They never hit him. Uh, adrenaline, when adrenaline starts pumping and you're scared, um, you don't know what's going to happen. But they must have fired close to a thousand rounds at that guy and never put a scratch on him. When I looked up, he was running away because he was outnumbered. He was outgunned. But uh, that's the closest that I know. That's the closest that I know that I almost got it. I mean, in, uh, when you're in a convoy and you're ambushed and you're taking rounds from uh, snipers, I don't know how close, you know. So your group was in charge of finding out where enemy troop movements were coming? Yes. What, did you do any special types of missions at all, or is that mainly what you did the whole time? Well, no special types of, I, I don't know what you mean by special types of missions, but the missions, sometimes that we would have to, after we ordered a B-52 strike, um... Or, um, or like an artillery strike. We would go, we had helicopters and would go with pictures to see what the effectiveness was of the, of, of the, the orders that we, we gave. I mean, we wanted to see what, ha was there a body count? Did they kill anybody? Um, was there any damage to the, uh, it, most of the stuff was on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The, you know what the Ho Chi Minh Trail was. Most of the stuff was on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, we would fly over there. And um, and see what kind of effectiveness the orders that we gave, you know, how they did. Sometimes it sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad. 
How long in total were you overseas in Vietnam fighting? The tour of duty was one year. I was there for one year. When do you remember when you re returned home back to the United States? Of course. When was that? I, I, it was July of nineteen seventy one, right? Yeah. Was it easy returning back to normal life? Yeah. It wasn't so bad. I mean, it was. It wasn't hard to do. I mean, I think the hardest part was the other way around. Cool. I mean, you know. You're in your house with your mother and father watching TV with carpeting and eating good food and all that. And three days later, you're sleeping on a pile of rocks with a dirt floor trying to figure out where you're going to eat when it's 110 degrees. That was the, tough, uh, that was the tougher adjustment than, than coming home the other way. If what you're asking me about is uh, delayed stress syndrome... Um, You know, I had a I had a friend that had it, that got it, and uh, one of my best friends was um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Greg Crampton, a uh, kid I grew up with. He was the most decorated soldier in, in uh, from Midland County, Michigan, most decorated soldier. He had silver stars. Uh, Silver stars, bronze stars, uh, medals everywhere, but uh, he could not handle. It. He got he got the stress syndrome and ended up committing suicide. What did uh, or do you remember what, how you felt when you heard the major combat in Vietnam was over? Well, what I remember is watching it live on television as it was happening. A false idea? Yes. And I was more in awe of remembering the places that I saw on TV. I remember all those buildings. I, I, I slept in a couple of those buildings. I, I gave reports in some of those buildings. I, uh, you know, the embassy. I had uh, the United States Embassy. I was there, you know. Um, the, I, I, I don't think I felt, I know I wasn't surprised because, you know, your history will tell you how corrupt the government was and how nobody was surprised. I guess, I guess my only, I guess the only thing that surprised me was how easy it was. You know, and, and that's the reason we didn't win the war. The reason we didn't win the war is because the stuff that means people wouldn't fight. They would fight. There were some super super tough soldiers and, and some good men on the other side, but generally the people are just tired of war. They just wanted to forget about it. And when the, when the North Vietnamese started rolling in with those tanks, the South Vietnamese basically let them waltz right in, put down their weapons and let them waltz right in. So I guess the answer to your question is no. I wasn't surprised. I don't, have, I don't, I don't remember feeling anything other than... than you know, I just don't, I don't have any emotions about it. What did you do after the war was over? Did you go back to school or did you go right into a career? When my war was over? When, you, when, when I was back. over, yeah, I went back, I went back to college, yeah. And then did you get a job? Yeah, you? then I went out and made a, tried to make a living. After everything you went through, what was the most memorable moment for you? Memorable moment? You mean there or just Anytime, over the whole experience? training, war? Well, I think, I don't know if there's a...